<laughs> yeah, he was uh, like the third to announce uh, this okay. detection of some sort of an object at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. But now we are talking about external galaxies with a galactic astronomer, meaning that he is one of the best in the whole galaxy. And it's my friend, Adam Reese. Where are you joining us from today, Adam? I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Ah, beautiful Baltimore, the crab cake capital of the world. Yep. I remember yep. visiting yep. there when I was a nine-year-old visiting Baltimore for the first time and seeing all these bail bonds places. And I remember one, Adam, and it said uh, their logo, their motto was, we get your feet back on the streets. And I just thought that was so sweet. You know, I thought it was wonderful. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so it's great to see you again. And we have many, many people watching online. We have questions coming in rapidly. And uh, we'll let the chat room kind of fill in. And uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, it's great to have you back on the show. You're a three-time guest now, and uh, you've been so generous. In the time that we, since we talked last, there uh, have been a lot of developments in your universe and in uh, cosmology as a whole. And we want to talk about all that and take uh, questions from the audience, because I have the brightest audience in the known universe. Uh, and they're just champing, you know, chomping or champ they're champing or chomping at the bit to talk to you about these new results. Uh, so first of all, um, I want to begin by maybe just getting from you uh, what what has been achieved is so spectacular. I'm teaching cosmology this quarter, and I want to get your uh, input on some of this. But I always, you know, I have to brag and name drop. And actually, this is my office hours now. So Physics 162 students, uh, you're being monitored in the chat room. Uh, you have to ask a question and you won't pass the class. Just kidding. Um, but here's your chance to talk to a renowned astronomer um, yeah, stump and the champ. That's like <laughs> stump the champ. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we talked a lot this year, just in the last couple of months, about the mysterious universe of yeah. things like uh, uh, of things like uh, supernovae. I want to ask you first. So I brought in this this year, Adam, and then I'll let you talk because I'm sorry, I'm just so excited to talk to you. But this year, I decided to do something new in cosmology: just do lab demonstrations. Can you imagine lab demos in a cosmology class? Um, so I brought in like Bunsen burners and black bodies and Doppler shift things. But now I brought in actually a supernova. So I have a, I have a supernova Ooh. core collapse, which I'll, I'll send you because your chap right. your chapter one in, in my most recent book that's like uh, uh Hoberman sphere right oh that's right yeah very good yeah. uh so we could do a demonstration of supernova what fascinates you the most about these objects how well do we know what they are are they really standard candles that I preach to my students or are they not standard yeah. candles? right so um just to be clear there's two two basic types of supernova the kind in your hand is the core collapse and those are when massive stars collapse uh, and then rebound and explode. And the kind that we use for cosmology is a different type. Uh, they're thermonuclear supernovae, what we call type 1A, which is kind of a, a taxonomy name. But what we really mean is a white dwarf that approaches the Chandrasekhar limit, which is, as we know, a sacred limit, a, a physics limit, uh, that uh, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, that electron pressure cannot hold up the star, and you get runaway thermonuclear explosion. And so are, when you ask, are they good standard candles, you know, the Chandrasekhar limit gives us a reason to believe that they ought to be pretty good standard candles. In fact, you know, there is nothing else I'm aware of at that kind of scale where we get a nice physics limit like that, that, that gives you a reason to believe that they would all blow up at the same luminosity. Now, there are small variations and with those we can empirically calibrate. And so that's what we do. And then we see these very far away and they are as bright as 5 billion solar luminosities. And so we can see them very far away and gauge the expansion rate of the universe. Mm. And before that, uh, the gold standard was, uh, or Cepheid variables. And I've always, you know, been a little confused. How do we, how did, you know, Levitt and, and Hubble and Slifer, to whatever extent he was involved in that, how did they calibrate so accurately the period luminosity relationship? I mean, it seemed like, they, how did they, they didn't even know about what the nucleus was back then in the 19 teens. <laughs> how could they possibly know with confidence that Cepheids were these nuclear processes when they didn't know anything about nuclear physics? Right. So part of the answer is they didn't calibrate them very well. They calibrated them very poorly. And so the consequence was uh, misgaging distances in the universe by a pretty dramatic amount, by uh, close to an order of magnitude. Um, and so that has been the journey we've been on for a hundred years. I would say, you know, when Henrietta Leavitt saw 
Cepheid variables in the small Magellanic cloud, right? She recognized, well, they are all equidistant to us. And so the fact that their period correlates so strongly with their brightness told you that they were excellent standard candles. But this quest to figure out exactly what their luminosity is and therefore be able to use them to gauge distances and the expansion rate, the Hubble constant, that's been the hard part. That's what's taken us, I'm going to say, 100 years and will go on into the future. Uh, but that's really what the news is, is that we think now we've calibrated them very well. How much would you give in terms of children or teeth that you, you were kind enough to offer to pull one of my teeth so that we could make this part? Uh, how much would you give for a, a supernova of any kind uh, at a redshift of three or two or something like that? Is that even in the realm of possibilities? And if it were, would it just nail this forever to have such a high redshift, you know, calibrated uh, standard candle? Or am I just wishfully thinking? Um, yeah, actually, what's interesting is to measure what we've been talking about most recently, the Hubble constant. We actually don't want to go to particularly high redshift. We want to make extremely precise measurements all in the local universe. So the action here is all at redshift less than 0.1. It's all, you know, 100 million light years or hundreds of millions of light years because we want to be able to compare to how the universe looked early on in your, you know, your bailiwick, the cosmic mm -hmm. microwave background, and compared to what, uh, the cosmic microwave background plus the standard model predicts the expansion rate should be today. Mm. Right. And that's where the tension will come in and we'll get into that tension. And as I've said, we need to have a, 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 a cosmologist uh, friendly therapist for the field. And I want to get into yeah. your favorite non you know, um, uh, supernova related tension. We'll get to that. There's a lot of tensions coming up. And as your fellow Nobel laureate, Steven Weinberg once said, physics thrives on crises. But yeah. he said, luckily, there aren't that many crises. Uh, I think that, <laughs> that's no, really... <laughs> right. that, that is something I, I certainly would want people to understand is when they hear us talk about crises and tensions, uh, they might hear it like it's a bad thing. And mm -hmm. uh, to us, this is the only way we move forward is to find places where our understanding breaks down. And yes. so this has been the path forever of science is we have a model, you know, all models are useful, but none are correct and we apply that model and it breaks somewhere and that allows us to learn more yeah i think that's so exciting and there's a surfeit of these uh of these crises uh question that i got during this class at least i think it was a question i was talking about the uh the fundamental parameter of interest in cosmology of course the hubble constant that you're so expert in is uh is has been called the most important number in cosmology then after that, Sandage and others called the deceleration parameter, uh, which you uh, have <laughs> more than your fair share of experience because you measured it was negative for the first time with your collaborator uh, and past guest on the podcast. I've had Brian Schmidt on since we last chatted, and he's a lovely man. And I do want to talk about some of the non-astronomically significant, uh, but still uh, astronomically significant in terms of career advice that he gave to me based on his experience with you. Um, and being kind of a colleague and mentor with you the, and, and the lessons yeah. that you guys learned to improve the culture of astronomy. Right. I know that's so important to you. You've been actually, you know, a really quiet, you know, uh, champion of inclusivity and, and, and developing this community in a way that few people knew. But, you know, they say the, the most uh, the, 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 the kind of most righteous people are hidden hidden, hidden righteous. And uh, I always say I want to be the most famous hidden righteous person in the world. But anyway, uh, we'll talk about that later. But because I think you have extremely uh, deep insight that hasn't been shared maybe so much on podcasts like this. So maybe we can get into that if you'll for, uh, indulge me. But, um, but I want to get back to A. So A, the scale factor is this immeasurable object, this entity that kind of governs everything. The first derivative evaluated today is the Hubble constant. Second derivative is related to the deceleration parameter. And then one of my students stood up in class and said, what about the jerk? And I was sure. like, what did he call me? What did you say? Uh, oh, no, I said, is this about Steve yeah. Martin, the great one? Right. Um, well, how come nobody yeah. talks about jerk? First of all, what is the cosmic jerk? And does anybody study it? Yes. So what we're talking about in general is looking at the universe expand and quantifying that by a series of derivatives or changes. So like any object you throw 
an object, you could talk about its speed, and then you could talk about its changing speed, its acceleration, and you could talk about its changing acceleration, which is the jerk. And so uh, in the case of our universe, uh, the universe does have a jerk, and it's not me. Uh, it's not you, <laughs> it's not me. Uh, but it is the transition from accelerating to decelerating. And so uh, we believe that the universe was matter dominated in the beginning because everything was very close together. And so attractive gravity would dominate simply because uh, the separation between objects was small, at which point the universe would be decelerating. Then as it grew in size, then uh, matter was more spaced out. And then this dark energy uh, which was sort of waiting in the wings, became the dominant uh, source of gravity and the universe began accelerating. So by definition, if you change from deceleration to acceleration, you have a change in the amount of that. And so that is the jerk. That is the third derivative. Uh, and it has been measured. Um, it, we measured it, I think, first with supernovae in the early 2000s using the Hubble Space Telescope. At that point, our goal was just to see if you could see that transition, uh, and you can, uh, it's been measured more recently with baryon acoustic oscillations and, and other techniques like that. So if the universe did not have a jerk, then we'd be in big trouble in our understanding. That would be an even bigger tension than the ones we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Something to look forward to. Um, <clears throat> and an allied kind of you know concept that I talked to the students about in this uh, year's cosmology class had to do with the um, the notion of uh, of, of what you guys call the distance modulus. The symbol is mu, if I'm correct. And that's sort of the difference between the apparent magnitude and the intrinsic magnitude, which can be related to the observed flux of an object, uh, which we detect and we can uh, classify and quantify. Uh, and then the intrinsic it has to do with the ability to standardize these candles. And I, I think when we spoke in late 2020 uh, with Wendy Friedman and others about the Hubble tension as it was back then, there were some thoughts that she had brought up about other objects that could be the capital M in that uh, in the distance modulus. What has been going on in that field? Because I, I that I believe if I'm not correct, uh, if I'm not mistaken, rather, you don't study particular you know these different objects, tip of the you know red giant branch or whatever they're called. Um, but what's been the most exciting or interesting developments um, in that field, and how does it play into the measurements that you and your colleagues are releasing uh, recently? Um. You know, to me, one of the biggest developments just in the last few years in this whole game has been uh, a new satellite, Gaia, this European satellite, which has the means to measure parallax, which is the really the gold standard of measuring distances. You just observe an object over the course of a year and you watch its position change as the Earth goes around the sun. And uh, just by knowing the diameter of the Earth's orbit, uh, and simple geometry, you can tell how far away things are. Um, and so this business we talked about 100 years ago, Henrietta Leavitt, uh, knowing that sepiates were good standard candles, but not knowing their true luminosity, and for that matter, any kind of star and its true luminosity. Um, Gaia has really revolutionized, you know, quietly in some ways in the last couple of years, our ability to calibrate the true luminosity of these objects. And so the work, uh, if we get to it, uh, about what's new, uh, I'm going to tell you about is based on being able to calibrate luminosities much better with Gaia, uh, particularly the what's called the third data release, which just came out last year. Mm. And that involves astrometry, um, of course. Um, right. Let's the see. Science get... of measuring the positions of things very carefully. Yeah, I, I, fantastic. Yeah, I definitely want to get into that. And I want you to um, uh, do one small favor, Adam, because... We have a lot of people watching, over 100 people watching live and asking the one topic that they're most interested in is can you uh, mute your laptop's vibrations uh, because they are getting uh, a little bit motion sick. Let's see if we could do that. That would be great. All right. Okay. And thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so Maya Benowitz, who is a longtime friend and supporter of the show. Thank you, Maya. She is asking the question I think that's on everybody's mind, and, and maybe we will uh, slowly transition to it now. Is there a consensus in the community about the Hubble tension? The, today's result is, or this last week's result, is not specifically about the tension. It's about an exquisite measurement that you have done, which may be, if I'm not mistaken, 
the final you know measurement by the Hubble Space Telescope, and that will dovetail into uh, of this of this type of, of parameter, the gold standard of ga set of galaxies, or uh, you call them mile markers or so forth. Um, so first of all, is there a consensus, or is that not really the case? I mean, if I talked to right. a theorist yesterday, and she and Aegis at, at uh, NYU, and, and she was saying there's no consensus, <laughs> at least from the theoretical perspective. So what's the current right. In the, in yeah. the astronomy so, community. So the, the, the news release that we had was based on a very large study that's taken a number of years where we've more than doubled the data set. And as I also mentioned, we've been using Gaia now to calibrate. Uh, and so we've gotten to one kilometer per second per megaparsec uncertainty. Uh, so that's really the big news is to get to, you know, 1.3% in the Hubble constant. Now, the answer we get, 73 uh, is now five sigma higher than what you predict the value should be based on the cosmic microwave background and the cosmological model. So, you know, five sigma is pretty high. Uh, you know, we, we normally say in science uh, that we're comfortable once we're at five sigma of not thinking of attributing this to just luck or, you know, being unfortunate or something like that. So, uh, you know, in terms of being definitive, I, I would say that's about as definitive as we could be in an empirical sense or an absolute sense. Then, you know, you could look at other techniques, other ways of measuring. And in the, the late universe or the local universe, those values range from about 70 to 75. Uh, but I think a, a good way to summarize is there's no really precise measurement in the late universe that is coming in any lower than the cosmic microwave background. So they're all high. They're at different levels high, but they're all high. Mm. And our result has the smallest uncertainty and it's five sigma high. So I would say it's very difficult to look at this data and make a case that these two things are consistent. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the tension's getting exacerbated. Um, and yeah, the more so I would say the, the, you know, people are in pretty wide agreement that this is a very significant issue uh, that from the empirical side, we need to take very seriously. Uh, I know my colleagues feel that way because they're putting in uh, requests for telescope time and winning that and grants and whatnot. So, you know, that's our measure of when something is serious. Uh, but on the theoretical side, there's no consensus on what or how to explain this. Mm -hmm. And when you make claims, as you do, that this is incredibly precise, is it the most precise that Hubble can do? And are there any other, is there any hope to improve things on the yeah. observational front, not the theoretical yeah. front, but observational? Yeah. So, you know, our, our rate limiting step is usually how many type 1a supernovae we can reach with Hubble. Reach by meaning observe with Cepheid variables or tip of the red giant branch or Myra's or any kind of star. And the reality is that uh, there's only about one type 1a supernova that appears each year that is within that volume, within that range. And so what we've just published now is 42 supernovae that are basically the last 40 years worth. The, basically the entire history uh, over which we've been observing with digital uh, tools. You know, you don't want to go back to the era of photographic plates. So... Now it's a waiting game. You just wait for new ones to appear at about once a year and you can do the math. It's very difficult to imagine ever even doubling this data set mm -hmm. in the lifetime of Hubble. So when you say, is this the best we can do? I mean, I'm sure technically there'll be, you know, improvements here and there, but you know, the sort of big picture, how many type 1a supernovae we can, we can collect and, and use for this measurement. You know, there's just no realistic way uh, that Hubble, that telescope, is going to uh, improve on this very much. Mm. Now, your advisor and my uh, late great, your PhD advisor and my late great friend, Andy Friedman, uh, may he rest in peace, wonderful man. We miss him terribly here at UCSD. Um, he used to tell me that the infrared had uh, many benefits, uh, that in the infrared type 1As, um, according to work that you and, and Bob and, and Andy and others had done, uh, was significant. And I wonder if you can explain what that is, why that is, and um, and if so, if there's anything that Webb, this, you know, vaunted right. new instrument, can it say anything about type 1a supernovae that could improve upon even what you've done with Hubble? Right. So um, when we talk about infrared versus optical, um, we're talking about how you observe the standard candle that you're looking at, whether it's a Cepheid variable or a type 1a supernova. Um, and as 
uh, astronomers know, as you know very well, there's dust in the universe. Uh, and dust is very tricky stuff. Dust <clears throat> often messes up measurements. It, it dims the light of things we see, fools us into thinking they're further away than they really are. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to correct or account for dust because it generally reddens the light as well. But another powerful method is to observe in the near infrared or even far infrared, where you basically see through the dust, that the dust grains tend to be small enough and the wavelengths of light in the near infrared are large enough that they essentially pass through the dust without any effect. Um, and so for years with Hubble, the, the work I've been talking about, we've been observing the Cepheids in the near infrared, but not the supernovae in the near infrared. Now there's been a number of papers in recent years that have taken our results on the Cepheids and applied supernova data in the near infrared from, from uh, as you mentioned, Andy Friedman uh, and Bob Kirshner and others. And they generally get the same answer, whether we're in the optical or the near infrared. Um, and so that part hasn't changed the story very much. Now the James Webb Space Telescope is a telescope that operates exclusively pretty much in the infrared. Uh, it's a cold telescope. Uh, and so it will have a lot of power to look at objects in the infrared and it has the capability to extend some techniques we use for distance measurements. So I think it will certainly help uh, on this overall quest to better understand the expansion rate of the universe. Um, it's not obvious it's going to give us you know, a great improvement in precision, but it might test some of the ideas people have about some of the astrophysical objects being somehow weird or different. Mm. Very good. <clears throat> and I'm um, getting a question from a man who goes by the name that I almost chose for my second born child. His name is Memes of Destruction. Uh, not the means of destruction, the memes of destruction. Anyway, he asked, uh, thank you so much, professors. Are there any updates or thoughts on hawking points? Now, I don't know if Adam is particularly um, up to date on I hawking points. Okay. Yeah, I have no updates <laughs> on that. <laughs> Well, you know, Hawking uh, was known for many things. And, and Sir Roger Penrose, who came up with this idea for Hawking points as a way to determine the after effects of previous aeons or eons, your fellow Nobel oh, no. laureate, um, he used to say that making a bet with Stephen was the safest bet you could possibly make because given enough time, he would always change his opinion. So right. you'd always win the bet. Um, so Hawking points are these hypothesized leftover effects of black holes that are the only objects that can perhaps survive the uh, conformal cyclic cosmological terminus, if you will, uh, after trillions of years when uh, nothing left is, is, is around, black holes endure. Black holes and actually magnetic fields endure. And they claimed back in 2018 that BICEP was correct. We did detect primordial B modes, but they weren't from uh, inflationary gravitational waves, as you know, Rogers uh, finds that anathema. Uh, and uh, but instead, we're from the aftershocks of these previous eons. Now, that allows me to pivot to my favorite explanation, as you know, for the Hubble tension, uh, which is res a resolution via primordial magnetic fields. I've done some videos on this channel, including one uh, called uh, Hubble tension solved with magnetic fields. And we had uh, a great uh, conversation with uh, Levon Pagosian, and I've uh, been in touch with his uh, with his colleague. Um, Karsten, I always have trouble pronouncing Karsten's name, and I know he's listening because he he hectors me when I make uh, when I make bad uh, errors about his theory. Kar Karsten uh, Jadanzik, Jadanzik. Right. Hopefully he's on. Anyway, they well, I think, can say primordial primordial yeah. magnetic fields look like as good a solution as any uh, <laughs> That's... that I've seen, and I don't I don't mean it in a demeaning way. I mean okay. uh, quite seriously. Like the you know the idea basically the easiest way, and there are no easy ways, but the easiest way to solve the Hubble tension is to change the conditions of the universe uh, before the cosmic microwave background radiation leaks out. Uh, basically make it different than the model in a way that generally makes recombination happen earlier, makes the sound horizon smaller. And my understanding is primordial magnetic fields would produce these inhomogeneities that would clump up the universe faster earlier and cause that kind of condition. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, at a, you know, basic level, it could work. Now the devil's in the details. So, you know, I'll leave to you to, to tell us yeah. whether the details work. Yeah, well, we're most interested in detecting this via what's called the Faraday rotation of 
primordial mm-hmm. polarization fields would be revealed uh, by the existence of a deviation, so-called forbidden correlation. Sounds exciting, sounds sexy. Uh, but it's really just the, uh, uh, the non-vanishing of so-called EB or TB correlation functions. And we're very sensitive to that with instruments like uh, the Simons Observatory upcoming and current Simons Array. So that is one of our primary goals. It's funny, Adam, because we proposed this, as you know, decades ago, starting with BICEP uh, to measure inflationary B modes. And that was basically a one trick pony for BICEP, at least as I thought about it back in 2001. Um, But since then, we've really come upon things that could invalidate uh, such closely held principles as Lorentz invariance uh, symmetry. Mm -hmm. As cosmic uh, parity violation and, and other exotic phenomena. But along the way, I don't know philosophically if I've ever asked you this, but what is your, you, you do so much, you know, and I, I put in my uh, first book, Losing the Nobel Prize, a whole, you know, chapters uh, seven, eight, and nine are dedicated to Adam. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and chapter one of my newest book, Into the Impossible, is Adam, literally. Uh, but I put in, the thing that strikes me about you is very good taste. You've, uh, not just in, you know, which podcast you come on, but you have very good taste that you've cultivated. Um, are you still there? Uh oh, I might have praised him too much. Adam, are you still there? Let's see if we'll come back on. Um, but I, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to praise him while hopefully he comes back on. Um, maybe his laptop bounced too much. <clears throat> but the um, what I was going to say is that uh, as an as an astrophysicist or as a scientist. You need to kind of be very selective about what you choose to dedicate your finite amount of time uh, on Earth to, uh, so to speak. And what Adam's been particularly good at is not only finding the right problem, but attacking its most interesting aspects with the greatest possible tenacity that one could envision. So here is Adam. Let's see if I can add him. Adam, can I add you? Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sorry. Yeah, I was praising you so much. Your head swelled. My, my head exploded. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> um, so you were you, you were talking about my taste. I yeah, think. I was saying yeah. I was saying it's one thing to to be technically competent, but it's another thing to be doggedly in pursuit of very subtle, very confusing and perplexing effects, and consistently do that. And I, I have an anecdote in this book about how yeah, sitting behind you at some conference before we really got to know each other. I mean, we met in the two thousands, and but we never really got to know. Each other. But I remember like just watching you. Know, I'm like, this guy already has a Nobel Prize. He works his ass off, and he's got incredible hard uh, hard problems that he has incredible taste to choose which part of your valuable time to dedicate to. How did you cultivate that? Was that from Bob? Was that from just innately? Is that is that how you're wired, or how would you communicate to my students? Yeah, and I, mean, I guess I would there? say all of my mentors, all of my you know teachers, uh, have always seemed to have that that good taste, and always talked about you know what would be really important to do or what's really interesting, um, and uh, and I think you know in many ways cosmology is that kind of pursuit overall. I mean, it's a very reductionist science. Uh, we have very few, very big questions. And, you know, the, the the key to cosmology is sort of keeping focused on the big picture, you know, the big questions while, you know, you go off on a, on a deep dive on the details of, of some object or some measurement, uh, but never really falling in love with the, the object or the measurement, getting back to the big picture, you know, reminding mm-hmm. yourself, you know, these are tools to answer a question. Uh, it's not about the tools themselves. And so, right. you know, I feel like I always learn that from my mentors. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so Maya is asking again, uh, she's a theoretical physicist and a brilliant one at that. She's asking, can you comment on Wendy Friedman's tip of the red giant branch measurements of the Hubble constant? Uh, yeah. What degeneracies does that break and which ones does it still suffer from? Right. So um, the the tip of the red giant branch is a fainter standard candle than Cepheids. It's a kind of a newer tool that people are using. Um, and they have a much smaller sample because you can't uh, uh, reach out as far with those. Uh, however, oh, in there are about eight galaxies where we can observe distances with both tip of the red giant branch and Cepheid variables. And this is in our paper uh, where we have the measurements of the same places. They agree extremely well. Um, Mm. And so to me, both techniques look good. uh, But then as we increase our sample, uh, our precision goes up. um, (coughs) And uh, although the results are consistent with tip of the red giant branch, they're more significant um, in terms of the inconsistency with uh, the cosmic microwave background. Mm. 
Very good. Uh, Andy Oates, long-term uh, fan of the show and, and friend of the show, asked, would we get more precise measurements of the Hubble constant by placing multiple te telescopes at different Lagrange points? So he's not satisfied with L2. Could we do anything? I mean, Hubble is not in a Lagrange point. Hubble's like no, not, in our backyard. Right. <laughs> Could you get anything well, from stereoscopic right. or is that like Gaia's purview, so to speak? Well, I mean, yeah, in principle, if you could put two uh, identical observatories very, very far apart, uh, you could measure parallax, uh, you know, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be really cool to do. But, you know, to improve over what we get from the Earth as the Earth goes around the sun, you know, we get two astronomical units of diameter. And so you'd basically have to park one of those things over by, you know, Neptune or something uh, to really, you know, make headway. So uh, I would say Lagrange points don't really help in that regard. Right. Well, we've had proposals from uh, Edward Witten recently to send spacecraft out to look for planet nine. And uh, that would take about a hundred years and measure a time difference of less than a microsecond uh, for our great great grandchildren to do. So maybe it's not so outlandish. Throw on a, a couple of telescopes on that bad boy and get it out to uh, way beyond Lagrange points. Let's see, uh, another uh, gentleman uh, who has a name that I also considered for my, my firstborn, his name is Zero Skull. First of all, he says I'm a fanboy of Adam Reese. All right, fine. Well, you know, I have to give him his due. I have to be, you know, respectful to Adam because I did beat him once in a, in a very yeah. prestigious competition uh, right. where I came in first and in a selection of potential Nobel Prize winners in 2005. And, you know, Adam proved me wrong, I suppose. But but anyway, uh, so, yes, I am a fanboy, zero skull. But, uh, but your second question is quite interesting. You're talking about, um, you know, the uh, gravitational effects. And I taught my students this uh, recently, Adam, uh, gravitational measurements, time delay measurements of the Hubble constant. Are those going to ever yield anything of interest? Or, or where, where do we stand with that? First of all, could you describe the physics, look into your you know, crystal ball of, of gravitational lensing and uh, explain a little bit about time delays maybe? Um, and then where could they possibly go? How competitive are they if at all? Yeah. Um, so this is a technique where you look at uh, a, a very far away background object, I'm going to say, maybe it's a quasar or a galaxy, and there's some intervening galaxy or cluster or something um, that acts as a lens. And so it bends the light gravitationally. And so you may get multiple paths of light that are on their way uh, to some angle that would not come back to you, except the bending uh, due to the gravity uh, brings the light back to you. So you might see multiple images. Uh, and you recognize that those multiple images are traveling different paths with different lengths. So if you have good telescopes and those objects vary in some way, you can measure the time delay between those paths. And uh, if you solve the whole problem, then you could ultimately get distances and ratios of distances and the Hubble constant. Um, the trick or the challenge in many cases is knowing what that lens looks like, how mass is distributed in that lens, whether it's a galaxy or a cluster. We know it has a lot of dark matter, but we don't always know exactly how that matter is distributed. And so this is what I have to say in, in my field, we call model dependent. Um, you know, the answer often depends on the model that you have for how the matter is distributed. Um, so, you know, to my way of looking at it, it's a little less direct, uh, a little less empirical, uh, and it has this this model uncertainty. And so people have debated for a while now what the right form of that, uh, the mass distribution is. Um, and so uh, there's one group, uh, the Holy Cow team, kind of a cool uh, acronym, uh, who said if you use the most conventional mass models, uh, what are called power law or Navarro, Frank and White uh, models, then they get a Hubble constant of 73 plus or minus two, very similar. Uh, if they don't use those or they open up that mass model uncertainty, then they could get anything from in the mid 60s to the to the mid 70s. So the answer they get is fairly degenerate with knowledge of this mass model. And so I think they continue to work on improving knowledge of the, the mass models. Um, and so I think this pertains either to clusters or to individual galaxies. Ah, fascinating. Um, thanks for that, Adam. So a reminder for those that are just tuning in now, we can getting close to about 200 people <clears throat> watching on all different platforms. No pressure, Adam. <clears throat> so we're talking with uh, Professor Adam Reese, professor at Johns Hopkins, 
and uh, also chapter one is uh, is his biggest accolade. I think is is that he's chapter one in my second book, uh, which is called Into the Impossible. Think like a Nobel Prize winner. If you like interviews like this, please do subscribe, but also leave a thumbs up on the uh, on the little icon there, <clears throat> so I can get uh, folks uh, like Adam and and hot hottest cutting edge stuff. We had Chef Dolman on last week talking about the exciting new results imaging the black hole at the center of our galaxy after the Titanic observations of M87. Uh, they followed up with Event Horizon. Uh, what's, what's most interesting to you outside of what you're doing? Like, what do you, what do, you do in your spare time? Uh, you know, what, what do you read in the nonfiction world of spare time, besides my books, of course? In, in What am I interested in, like, for example, in science? Yes, in science, um, yeah. You know, I mean, certainly it's not something that I work on, but the quest to uh, look for life around other planets is terribly interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the whole field of exoplanets and um, looking at their atmospheres and trying to see if there's biosignatures is uh, something that I, I certainly follow the that kind of work that my colleagues do. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question also kind of, uh, you know, um, what do they call those? Human interest, you know, get to know the noblest. Uh, behind you are several books. I'm sure most of those are or copies, multiple copies of mine that'll help put my kids through yeah. uh, graduate school. Um, people want to know, what else do you read? What's on that bookshelf, that impressive looking bookshelf uh, over your left I shelf? read a lot of history. Um, I'm, I'm quite, I, I minored in, in history uh, at MIT, which I don't know if that counts, but maybe. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> I've always been very interested in history and I'm in a, a, a book club on, in history. So uh, oh, wow. anyway, I read a lot of history books. Uh, I think you learn a lot about the present and future by reading history. I don't think things change all that much. And so uh, if you wonder how things will turn out, read history. <laughs> and you are a historian of the cosmos, right? You're looking at these sort of, yeah, ancient photons right. looking out in your, your telescope. Uh, so now I want you to look in the future. So look into your crystal ball and tell yeah. me a little bit about uh, where this field could be going. You're saying the bounds are sort of saturating from Hubble. Uh, is it that we need more theoretical understanding? Uh, how yeah. much of the of the error bar comes from yeah. systematics in the theory of type 1a's right so so i'll back up a little bit and say uh we went through a period in the early 2000s the 2000 aughts uh where everything fit very well um in fact you know we, we said you know cosmology was at a real consensus and that was great um and in fact many of us feel like we should have quit then because you know there were good feelings and, and everything was excellent however unfortunately we kept pursuing uh, more precise measurements over the entire field. Uh, you know, Planck CMB observations, BICEP, uh, the kind of Hubble constant measurements I've been talking about, weak lensing measurements and maps, all kinds of techniques. And as often happens, the better the measurements get, and the, the tighter the model is tested, uh, we start to see tensions crop up in not just the Hubble constant, but for example, uh, another quantity known as sigma eight, which is a, mm. a measure of how clumpy the universe is now. Uh, and again, sort of like we see with the Hubble constant, uh, all of the measurements locally in the late universe done of how clumpy the universe is shows it to be much smoother than you would predict based on the cosmic microwave background state of affairs and the cosmological model. So that's, you know, that's become kind of a second major tension. Um, and so looking into my crystal ball, you know, we will continue to improve measurements um, and uh, maybe more tensions will come up. Maybe really smart people will be able to explain how these relate to each other. Uh, maybe we'll learn how to make measurements better and that that will be an important part of the story. Um, so, you know, it's it's hard to look too far into the future, but uh, I would say there's going to be better cosmic microwave background observations. We're going to look for uh, signals of what I would call or what people call pre recombination new physics, which could show up in the the fine structure of the cosmic ray background power spectrum. Um, we're going to get observations uh, from of gravitational waves from LIGO and more advanced versions of LIGO uh, that are going to give us an independent way to measure distances in the Hubble constant. Uh, they're going to be better uh, weak lensing experiments from uh, new observatories like Rubin uh, and the Roman satellite is going to launch and Euclid is going to launch. Uh, so there's a lot of data coming and uh, I expect, you know, we will learn some new things. Yeah. And on that topic, uh, Chad Grosskopf, who's uh, a member of the channel, one of my valued members of the Into the Impossible family, he asked, can we use black holes expansion within a galaxy as a measure of, uh, to help with the cobble tension. I think I'm going to change it around and say, 
can LIGO or future incarnations, can they use a so-called standard sirens? Or will yes. that never be as compact? I mean, you're measuring things at the 1.3%, you know, right. uh, precision level that is also right. accurate at that level. Um, right. So yeah, can they ever do anything or is it just going to be like, okay, they're yeah. within five or 10% of what we're right. measuring? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think, you know, they're going to collect their first, I don't know, dozen or so. And that, that will give us some interesting constraints on the Hubble constant. The problem becomes when they try to reach a comparable precision where we are, um, it turns out it's quite difficult to calibrate their detector um, to actually figure out, you know, uh, how much strain, which is the quantity that they actually measure, uh, they actually see. And my understanding is that there are even quantum effects that become important in trying to calibrate it finally. And so, you know, I think they will have to develop new techniques to calibrate better. Uh, look, I mean, we're in some ways 100 years ahead of them, you know, thanks to Henrietta Leavitt. Um, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll catch up. They'll, they'll make progress. I don't know, uh, you know, how long it'll take to reach the precision we're at. But I think um, they will be able to weigh in on this problem in an interesting way, you know, hopefully in another five years or so. Mm -hmm. You kind of answered this from Jeremiah M. who's asking what's the most excited about in cosmology. You, you also, you know, you covered life, extra terrestrial life, et cetera. Uh, do you think, by the way, Adam, do you think there's any, you know, kind of um, priors that one could put upon uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence by the non-observation or no evidence for it? And, and I ask that because I've had on a lot of people, including uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Richard Powers, who's a wonderful writer. Uh, he wrote a book about astrobiology, which I think you'd love, uh, called Bewilderment. It's a fictional story about a father and son and dealing with death and, and all sorts of cool things, but also dealing with life in other planets. And I said to him, I, you know, I almost feel like, I don't think it's 0%, but I think it's so incredibly rare that or such an incredibly low probability that life exists in the, in the universe because I don't feel there's any evidence within our own solar system, despite the millions of years of uh, billions of years of exchange between planets. And I usually have my meteorite collection nearby. But anyway, it goes by the dirty sounding name of panspermia, which isn't dirty. Don't worry, we won't get canceled. But, but the fact that we have failed to observe life on Mars and, and any other uh, uh, sites in our own solar system, at least that has to put some Bayesian limits on the fecundity of the universe. Anyway, what do you feel? Do you feel like it's just there's so much space and there, literally <laughs> that there has right. to be life? I mean, you know, I, I think I, my view is the the common one held in our field, which is, um, you know, uh, there's a near infinite, if not infinite universe out there. And so no, no matter how rare you make life, it's going to be out there. Um, and so that's, you know, to first order my general thinking, I'm sure it is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, we have so many incredible uh, rolls of the dice, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. that it's bound to happen. Now, what's interesting for us is if it's sort of detectable within our much more local sphere. And I think that is the big question that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fair, re nobody really does know the answer to that one. Um, and so we will look, for example, with the James Webb Space Telescope, there's a number of programs that will begin to study the atmospheres of planets around other stars and uh, hopefully will teach us um, about the presence of that life. Speaking of life, uh, Kenneth M. is asking uh, if uh, the government has contacted great scientists like you or me uh, to help in the investigative process. Uh, I am tangentially involved with your alma mater's uh, famous uh, search now called the Galileo Project, uh, named after my favorite hero in astronomy, Galileo Galilei, run by Avi Loeb back at your alma mater. Uh, I want to ask you, um, I mean, I haven't been contacted. I'm not being cagey. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm blinking. I've had, I have something in my eye. Been contacted by aliens or by the government? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'd be more interested in the former, but yeah. the yeah. latter either. Yeah, either way. Right. Neither. Neither. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> now, do you think this is a subject that deserves you know, the funding, the attention in Congress. Um, a lot of uh, my, my viewers do like to speculate about this and like to hear from honest to goodness scientists such as yourself that are working at the highest levels. Um, you know, is this something that a serious scientist should pursue? You know, Avi gets a lot of kind of pushback. He's been a guest yeah. on the show many times. Right. Um, what do you think about this? Is it is it because of the prosthetic forehead problem that it's kind of ridiculed and not seen as a great vector to get tenure? Or do you feel like maybe you should spend 1% of your you know time yeah. on it or something? So, so when I went to graduate school, 
I almost worked on SETI. I thought about doing it. And actually my sister, my older sister said, you know, I don't, I don't really see how you're going to graduate and get a PhD if you don't detect anything. Uh, and uh, I followed her advice. Uh, however, I must say, uh, I do think that we should be working on this. We should be spending significant funding on it. It's the ultimate Hail Mary of all research. I cannot think of any discovery <laughs> that would be more profound uh, that would be more impactful in our the way we look at the universe to the way we look at each other uh, than the discovery of life around other planets. Um, you know, I, I have kind of fantasy hope that it would have this kind of existential impact on people. You know, maybe it's a being you know overly optimistic, but that it would cause people to sort of reset their perspectives in helpful ways. So, you know, on many different levels, I think uh, it's you know it's the greatest quest of all. Yeah, I, I certainly agree, and, and that's look. It's two people. And we have no, you know, fiduciary interest in this field, <clears throat> uh, and yet, um, and yet, we both find it interesting. I do, you know, with love and respect, I push back because I actually don't think it would be. Uh, I think it would be big news for a news cycle. Um, I see. I remember back in 1996 when you and I were grad students, not far apart from one another. Um, I was at Brown. No, or I'm going back, and uh, you were up at up at uh, Harvard, and um, I remember there was a there was a huge discovery. In fact, it made uh, the the uh, the White House lawn with Bill Clinton. Right. Mars rock. The Mars rock yeah. found in Antarctica, and you know what, Adam? That's never been disconfirmed. That 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 is right. still under active right. study, right. thirty years hence, and there's no telling where that was. Now, so right. actually, I do get as I often get. I often get you know, oh, you're part of Bicep, like. You guys won the Nobel Prize, right? In other words, like the newspaper on the front page, and I've told Dennis Overby this and other people, you know, the story goes on page one, the discovery claim, uh, as it did with Bicep, as it did with your supernova measurements. And But if there's a retraction, it's on B17 of the Saturday edition that nobody – so nobody knows that, that – I mean, very few people, even in astronomy, know that Bicep was disconfirmed. I mean, some, a lot of people do, but, but some people come up to me in astronomy and say, wow, that's amazing. Um, so I want to ask you, like, what, what, you know, to what degree should science sensationalism and, you know, I was joking, I read about your discovery in the New York Post, you know, last, <laughs> and just as they say, just because it's in the New York Post doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, but, you know, to what extent should scientists be responsible for their, you know, stray findings and, and things that go astray? Should we keep a budget, you know, in, in hand for retractions as well as press conferences? Uh... I think retractions are important. I understand that, um, you know, people don't cite errata as much as they cite regular papers and they yeah. generally don't put them uh, in the newspaper. And I know quite a number of papers, specific ones, which have made a big claim. And then, you know, later on, either retracted or through even the refereeing, the peer review process changed quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, it's just the nature of humans is to you know, be excited to hear something really, really interesting and then to find it much less interesting if it was, you know, retracted. But, yeah. you know, science overall is pretty good. I don't think we're led astray by these things very long. Um, yeah. You know, it might be that, you know, people on the street don't know uh, something was retracted, but people in the field do know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't uh, deter us for too long. Yeah. Very good. Well, Adam, if you have a few more minutes, I have a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, that's OK. Sure. Okay, so uh, Maya is asking another phenomenal question. God, Maya, I hope we meet someday. Uh, you're just full of ideas and questions. She's now asking about um, <clears throat> about uh, local dynamics that could masquerade as a cosmological constant. And I want to pivot off that question and maybe uh, turn it all around a little bit. For years, there was interest in MOND, Modified Newtonian right. Dynamics, as a solution for dark matter. And I'm wondering, inspired by her question, are there any analogs of MOND but for dark energy? Uh, other explanations, if you will, that could explain via modifications of gravity, Newtonian or otherwise, that could explain and account for, you know, uh, the observations that you and your colleagues have been making. Right. So, so to be clear, when we talk about any of the things we talk about, the accelerating expansion, the Hubble tension, everything, um, it's all based on assuming Einstein's general relativity works and that we can use the universe as a laboratory following the rules of general relativity. And so, you know, we would say, well, 
general relativity isn't right, all bets are off on these measurements and in the interpretations. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're always open to uh, a new idea for what gravity could be. Now, before I get flooded with tons of messages and, and uh, uh, papers or whatnot, the, it is very difficult. People have always struggled to come up with an alternative to general relativity that actually is not ruled out inside the solar system or on Earth <laughs> or many other things. And, you know, this is the difference between, you know, scientists and in some cases, you know, armchair scientists is they have an idea that's great, but you got to check it first and see if it's already ruled out. Uh, and as I said, nearly all of them are. Um, and so, uh, you know, the gauntlet is really thrown down by the universe uh, in terms of coming up with an alternative. However, you know, having said that, we don't have a quantized theory of gravity. We don't know how to unite general relativity with quantum theory, the, you know, physics of large and small. So there is reason to believe that there is still more to understand about gravity. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a very active area of research. Yeah. So uh, one last question from the audience before we break, and it has to do with, with sacred cows. Um, and I guess uh, the question I could be uh, summarizing it, um, maybe with some discretion on my part, um, if, if, if the question is by Craig Dean, is dark energy a sacred cow? In other words, has it reached the level of originally when you put this out in the 90s, you and your colleagues, it was your it was it was considered exactly the opposite. We didn't we didn't expect it. We thought Einstein was correct. The last word took tremendous courage for you and your colleagues to do that. But now it's become the standard. In fact, Barbara Ryden's wonderful book that I use is called calls it this, the benchmark model, and it's uh, and it's and it's phenomenal. So I wonder though, you know, is it is it possible that something could be almost like too successful? And in other words, if you say that this yeah. is yeah, go ahead, right? Or that we, we maybe or that we cling to it in some way that we mm. say well. There's got to be dark energy, so uh, I'm not open to other possibilities. You know, my experience is scientists are much more open than uh, people in many other fields. You know, we grew up with this idea that we have models that we're testing and falsifying, and we've seen through the history of science, this is a very successful process. So um, it's okay if we falsify dark energy or dark matter or anything, um, but uh, we still have to explain the evidence that led us to believe in them. So, you know, in the case of my colleagues and I, uh, what we discovered was not so much dark energy as we discovered that the expansion of the universe is speeding up, that it's accelerating. If there's another way to explain that without dark energy, you know, a modification to gravity or something, I think we'd be very open to that. I, I certainly know I would be. Um, and I just, I'm very confident in the science method that, you know, if the data is better for an alternative hypothesis than the ones that we have, then that will win out. It always has. <laughs> so when we talked uh, a couple of years ago in the interview that made the uh, opening chapter of my second book, Into the Impossible, <clears throat> we talked about something that I call the academic hunger games, uh, which is that you have all these hurdles to get up to and get through, and then finally you might get a, a faculty job. And if you get a faculty job, you might get tenure. And if you get tenure, you might win some prizes and get citations and so forth. And I asked you, do you ever feel like the game is broken? And you said, yes, I think it's not a great scheme. I am lucky that I did not feel compelled by that scheme. And that's something that's parenthetically always impressed me about you. you you've never been driven. Like the Nobel Prize for you is just, it was a great thing, obviously, but it wasn't like what you set off to do since you were a kid, uh, unlike some people, present company. Uh, but <laughs> but my, uh, my, my, my question now involves something that Brian Schmidt, and your fellow laureate, and I talked about, um, which is that he viewed with regret. And he was a postdoc, if I'm not mistaken, while you were a student and you guys were incredibly tightly, uh, you know, uh, working close together. And you had these competitors on the Supernova Cosmology Project led by Saul Perlmutter, uh, who has yet to reply to an email, let alone come on the show, but hopefully he will someday. Um, but Saul, you know, and his group, you know, Saul's a very mild mannered appearing person, but but from what I heard from Alex Filipenko and from, and from Brian was that uh, they regretted most kind of the what, what Brian called toxicity, that, that there was kind of a message communicated to young people like you um, that, you know, science is this incredibly cutthroat, as I say, the academic hunger games prevailed even within a collaboration. How did you overcome it? And um, you got, it's like, you know, children of divorce are more likely to get divorced, uh, uh, I'm told. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, how did you overcome it? And, and what advice do you give to mentors and, and other people like me and my audience 
to kind of, you know, show the right side of science as, as you've been doing so? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. It's a big question. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of reframe this as, um, you know, the, the role of competitiveness that shows up in science and is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? Uh, you know, lots of it is unhealthy. But on the other hand, just as I described, I mean, science is always this ultimate competition between ideas, uh, between data. Uh, you know, in the case of these two teams making this discovery, it was important to people to see two teams, uh, you know, uh, reaching similar conclusions. Um, so, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, it has positives and negatives. Uh, but, you know, you, you have to ultimately keep it in check because, you know, who are we competing with the universe? I mean, you know, the ultimate competition here is, you know, the universe sort of guards secrets, doesn't make things obvious as far as we can tell. And, you know, we're competing to try to figure out those things. And, mm -hmm. you know, the best science ultimately builds on other science. So, you know, I look at my quote competitors papers to learn things and to learn, you know, what should I do better? What should I do differently? What did they find from this experiment? So, you know, I think it just takes uh, scientists recognizing, hey, the competition is out there. It's in the universe. You know, the mm -hmm. challenges are out there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, we may have a little bit of local competition to see, you know, do we agree? Do we disagree? But, you know, you don't want to lose perspective. Uh, otherwise, you know, the science will lose, you will lose, and you'll be very unhappy. <laughs> well, Adam, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, anything you want to mention or something coming up for you? Uh, looking forward to getting back to conferences and so forth this summer. Sure. Maybe. And I'm looking forward to uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, everybody should look forward to July uh, is when I expect we will see first images. That's phenomenal. Yes, we've uh, had a couple of guests on, Hakeem Olashei and others um, on the show, and uh, talked about that and then definitely right. we'll have more uh, results and and uh great so. guests coming on so thank you so much i had uh, Jay, uh john mather on and got to get him back on as well because uh hey, it's it's great to have uh scientists that do outreach and communicate with the public and that's what i try to do on this channel i hope you'll all subscribe and and follow adam and uh and and myself and, and look forward to many many cool episodes coming up jared lewis is coming on the podcast and aegis who's got an interesting model called the, uh, called the Bouncing Cosmological Model, kind of competitor to inflation. She's a wonderful guest, recorded with her recently. And Adam, uh, thank you so much. A short notice. Uh, it's late in the night getting out there where you are. I, I do hope we can uh, meet again in person. It's been too long. Yeah, sounds good. Thank Take you, care, my Brian. friend. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.